everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Jeannie Davison and I'm the Industry Development Manager at Screenworks. Thank you very much for joining us today for the fifth and final of our Gender Matters webinars, which we're very pleased to be hosting in collaboration with Screen Australia and the Gender Matters Task Force. Now, as a national organisation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including those joining us for our webinar today, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. And in particular, I'd like to pay my respects to the Nyangbal people of the Bundjalung Nation, the traditional custodians of the land here in Ballina, where I'm speaking to you from today. So now it's my very great pleasure to hand you over to your facilitator today, Rosie Lord. Hello everyone. Um, and welcome to this webinar. It's so bizarre always doing these webinars uh, because I don't get to see all your wonderful faces and say hi to everyone. So if anyone wants to drop a quick hi into the chat, so I know there's at least somebody out there, that would be gorgeous. Um, so today I'm dialing in from Gadigal land of the Eora Nation and for reference, my personal pronouns are she, her. I am so excited by this panel because we have such a wonderful range of very accomplished and very esteemed guests here. Um, hey Liz, <laughs> um, who are going to tell us a lot about the work that they do, their journeys that they've had, um, and hopefully provide some really valuable insights into how everyone can get a bit of a step up and some strategies around how they're going to navigate their own careers. So the departments we're looking across are cinematography, uh, art, art department, sound recorders and designing, as well as editing. And now from what I know of everyone who's dialing in, we've got people who are budding and mid-career filmmakers across each of those technical areas, as well as people who are emerging and mid-career directors wanting to learn more about how they can work better with the, with the heads of departments from, from these different uh, areas as well. So we're going to be deep diving into not just what an individual person's journey is going to be, but what that collaboration looks like, what that filmmaking nexus is of finding the magic between each of those departments. So for anyone who doesn't know who I am and missed the directing webinar, my name is Rosie Lord. I am a multi-hatted filmmaker. I started in acting and then moved into producing and most recently I've moved into directing. Um, you might know me from uh, the web series starting from now that I worked with Julie Kalsif on um, or uh, my most recent project or two projects, one of which is Romance on the Menu, which is a rom-com up on Netflix and the other one, which is a dash cam found footage horror that is part of Dead House Dark that's up on Shudder. Um, check them both out. They're very different projects and um, I hope you like them. But that's enough of me jibber-jabbering. I would love to introduce Erica Addis. Now, Erica is an incredibly highly regarded cinematographer. She started as a clapper loader right back on Storm Boy and has worked across so many projects, some of which include For Love of Money, um, This Woman Is Not A Car, With Inertia, My Life Without Sex, Tokyo Rose, North, Something Creative, The Tightrope, Dancer and Kylie Tennant, um, Emily's Eyes, For All the World to See, My Own Flesh and Blood, Father's Footsteps, this list could just keep going on, but most recently Brazen Hussies, I believe, was the last one that you were working on, Erica, is that correct? It's one of the most recent ones that's um, been released, yes, that's yeah. correct. Wonderful, so you've got some more coming in the pipeline, by the sounds of it. Uh, there's a couple of other projects which are in production at the moment, so uh, um, yes. There's more work coming. <laughs> yes, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I would love to start um, by asking you for anyone who doesn't know what a cinematographer is, um, how would you describe in technical terms what it is that you do? It's such a long answer to that question, so I'll be as fast as I can. <laughs> um, so, as a cinematographer, I paint with light and with framing and time. So they're the three elements that I work with. So there's, you know, there's people in landscape in front of the, um, the lens and the way that, um, that the light and the colour in the frames play out and are constructed are all the things that I control and manipulate, I create and manipulate. 
So mm -hmm. um, that's a that's an incredibly um, sort of simple description of it. So everything that you see on the frame, is, um, in in on the screen in a frame, is um, a collaboration between the the director, the designer, and the cinematographer. So whatever is de um, designed by the production designer um, goes into creating the landscape that's in the film. Um, and the cast is, you know, the performance given by the cast, but all of that has to be lit and framed. And that's what mm. I do. I do the lighting and the framing. Mm, wonderful. So you're really, you're in charge of the camera and what it is that the camera records, but that is the overly simplistic version of it because the, the number of decisions that need to be made to even get to that point uh, are so complicated and varied. And then how that all translates story visually. Yep. What I always say is that, um, you know, the, the writer writes the script, the cinematographer shoots the next draft and the editor makes the film. That's mm -hmm. where the film gets made is in the cutting room. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it's um, the process of shooting is one of, um, of creating all of the material that can possibly go into the film. Um, because if it's not shot or it's not made by a digital artist, then the editor can't make, it, make anything with it. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So... And to actually get to that point where you're actually working with um, um, actors or with um, people playing themselves in documentaries um, is an enormous amount of pre-production goes into that to actually work out the whole way of, of approaching the, uh, the story. Phenomenal. I might put a pin in pre-production for a second because I'd love to come back and unpack what that prep is. But before we get there, um, could you talk us through what your journey's been or how you even started got moving into camera? What was your first interest and, and what was that journey through? Um, look, I was lucky. I got, um, I got the benefit of support from government funding for training uh, that was offered for women. And I took it up and um, I got um, spotted by a producer who, um, um, a very uh, dynamic, fantastic producer, Matt Carroll, who looked at me and went, mm, you're interesting, mm -hmm. and, um, and employed me. So through Matt, I got employment on um, some of the films at the South Australian Film Corporation that were being made at that time. And then the film that people most know um, that I worked on was, you mentioned Storm Boy, and I worked as the clapper loader on the Storm Boy crew. Um, and I went on from there and studied for three years at the film school in Sydney at, at Afters. Um, and I studied cinematography for three years, which um, compared to what is possible now seems like um, it was incredibly luxurious time. It was great. Mm. Absolutely. And then graduating as a student in, in that cohort, what, um, what were the next steps for you? What was the journey? Um, so the um, so from graduation, I I sort of had uh, I had more than one pathway, which I think is pretty normal. Um, that I sort of was juggling between things. So I was shooting films for friends. Um, I was invited to direct a documentary in Melbourne, um, and um, and I was working um, as a clapper loader. So I was sort of doing all of those things simultaneously, which um, got to a point where I didn't really want to be working as a clapper loader on features anymore. And I really wanted to focus on um, uh, shooting projects. So I, I'm, I, uh, I exited out of um, feature films and, um, and really specialised in documentary. Mm. Yeah, wow. Did you find that any of the relationships that you built whilst you were either um, in those very early days or whilst you were at film school have carried through with you? Totally. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, the friendships made at film school have absolutely, I've, they, they're my closest collaborators. They're not my only close collaborators, but um, but they are some of them. Yeah. yeah. So those, you know, they say that's what happens at film school, that you meet, you meet people and you work with them for the rest of your lives, and it's true. Mm. What do you find is that um, the biggest benefit with working with people that you've worked with for a long time? Um, it's the shorthand. You don't need to explain yourself. They already know your strengths and your weaknesses, and they forgive you some of your weaknesses, and mm -hmm. they um, <laughs> and they know what um, what what your strengths are. So um, so yeah, it's very. Um, I think it's just really efficient building mm. that shorthand. Mm. So coming back then to your prep question, or to the prep question that I put on the on the wall, mm. um, what do you prioritize in that in the early stages of pre production? 
Um, so, um, so in documentary work, the the, the pre-production is you know, very different from uh, from drama, and um, the I mean, but what you're doing always is you're telling a story. So. Um, who are the characters? I really want to meet the characters as soon as possible in a documentary um, because um, I'm going to be in their face with with lights and camera, and um, and I I want to have a relationship with them before the equipment arrives. Um, I want to see the locations because the locations are a critical character in the story, and I need to work out what I can actually do in those locations because they're. The, all of the um, they they provide the foundation, but they also provide um, or they have constraints in them that I then have to work out how to solve the, those constraints. I've got enough power. Will I have enough light? Um, can I get the equipment in and out? Um, all of those sorts of things. There's just a lot of logistical errors, uh, not errors, um, elements. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, sort of which way will the sun come from? You know, can, can where can we park our vehicles? There's a thousand logistical questions that that usually I will be looking for the answers for because um, that's part of part of what I get to do. Absolutely. And they all, it's interesting how many, well, how each of those critical questions, they might sound like the boring logistical part of the work, but all of them impact your capacity to tell story and your capacity to paint with that mind and those images. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, because if you, I mean, you can have all the ideas in the world and all the good intentions, um, roads to nowhere are paved with good intentions, something that's a that's a paraphrasing of an, that expression, but um, but you, um, it's intensely practical and um, um, all of filmmaking is intensely practical, but um, but on the set with a camera, you have to be able to um, put lights in places where they're safe and they won't um, fall on anybody. Um, you have to be able to move equipment around. You have to be able to store equipment. There's just um, all of those um, requirements have to be met in order to do the magic with the people um, who are performing in front of the lens. Fabulous, fabulous. Okay. Mm. I think I'm going to keep all the rest of my questions until we have everyone in the group. So thank you so much, Erica. Okay. And I am going to introduce uh, Gretchen Thornburn. Gretchen is an incredibly accomplished sound production designer, mixer and recordist um, and has worked in the screen industry for over 25 years. Projects that she's worked on that you may, may or may not know about are and this is from a very long list, but I, that if you want to go to IMD, you just keep scrolling. Um, but these ones include Winchester, The Dressmaker, I Frankenstein, The Death and Life of Otto Bloom, Killer Elite, and one of my gorgeous favourites, The Saddle Club. Um, Gretchen, I know I had to pull that one up. Oh, so wonderful. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. So I love lovely to have you here. So just in case... Now, just in case people don't understand as uh, someone who works within the sound department and you work across quite a few different roles in the sound department, can you break them down as to how they are different and what each of them are for me? Absolutely. I'll just clarify one thing. I'm not a sound designer. I'm just a sound recordist. Sorry, thank you. production sound mixer. So I'm the, the, the technical first base. Uh, okay. So in the sound department, there's a production sound mixer, which is what I do. Um, I It's my job to capture all the sound that is on a set or a location, whether that's the dialogue, whether it's sound effects, whether it's atmosphere tracks, all those things that add up to what happens on, on set. My job to make sure they say the script. Um, <laughs> depending on how the director feels about that. But um, some jobs I've worked on the script is a primary focus. Others, that it can be a bit more flexible. But uh, certainly got to make sure it all gets recorded one way or another. Uh, so that's a sound recordist. There's a sound designer who actually do the d overall design for the picture. That's a much further, that's in post-production. There's also a sound editor in post-production, dialogue editor in post-production. So they're all beyond, I supply the raw materials for them to all work with. Amazing. So you capture what is happening in the moment on the day that is live. Yes. That then can potentially go all the way through the end, the end finished film or potentially throughout the process gets um, chopped and changed and mixed around to then. Yeah, I usually say goodbye to it on wrap. Yeah. It the day unless I'm called back to uh, go back to a location and pick up some more atmosphere tracks or 
Uh, something to always remember for me with sound is that Eric will probably have something to say about this, but pictures show you, sound takes you there. So it's important as a sound recordist to come up with all the elements that will actually take people. Mm. Phenomenal. And on that, that taking people on that journey, what, what are the little, um, what are the tricks of the trade that you've learned across your journey, across your career? To listen <laughs> is the biggest one. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. Note to self. <laughs> we become very good listeners. <laughs> uh, you also have to be rather discreet sometimes. You hear a lot of things you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but mainly to listen and to collaborate and to try and interpret what people want. Wonderful. Wonderful. And so how did you start in the industry? What's been your career pathway? Uh, I started off uh, as a receptionist for Fred Skepsi. Back Amazing. When Fred was making Marlborough commercials. <laughs> Still made to those. Um, I became a production assistant there. Um, we parted ways and I went to a video company um, where I would do a bit of camera operating, but I also making storyboards, which in those days was way before computers and animation. So we'd actually literally draw pictures and animate those to have an idea for a television commercial. It was quite, it's very creative. It was good fun. Yeah, uh, phenomenal. It was. <laughs> then uh, I went to, oh, God, I got married and moved to Geelong. Yep. God, what am I doing here? <laughs> and uh, Deakin Uni just started. Um, I was there on April Fool's Day when it started. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> what a day to kick off. <laughs> exactly. Um, and there was an amazing media department and they had this idea of sending degrees off campus, which had not been done in Australia. Uh, so there were two guys who were better at camera than me. So it was literally sound, like which end of this microphone do I speak into? Mm -hmm. And um, So I was allowed the luxury of seven years of experimenting and exploring and learning by doing so. Wow, that's a nice, that is a luxury. It was an absolute luxury because we also did videos, so I would do all the sound on those as well. So we made it up as we went along, to be honest. It was fantastic. So uh, I did that for seven years. Then I went and spent my half of the house overseas, as you do, <laughs> for a couple of years. And uh, I went across Africa and I was sitting there thinking, how am I going to get back to Africa? Hmm and get paid for it. Hmm. So uh, that's when I formed the idea of location sound recording. I think I could work on documentaries, uh, which I ended up doing ultimately. But in between that time and going freelance, I also worked at AFTRS in Melbourne, running short courses for people who already work in the film industry, which by the way, was a fantastic way of getting loads of contacts. And I think contacts are one of the primary things in this business that you need. You need to constantly do your homework <laughs> and find out who's doing what. And then uh, 27 years ago, I threw it all in and went freelance. So I have survived. <laughs> wow, what a story. That is incredible. I love how in the early days you you tested out a couple of different roles and positions and, and different departments and then decided that sound was the one that really got you. It did, yep. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah, yes, yeah, so, and, and I've enjoyed it. It's also, you know, I think uh, as a woman back then, it was always hard to get in. And uh, I think uh, sound is a good job for females because mm -hmm. we're really good problem solvers and about 50% of my job is problem solving. And dare I say listeners, generally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what would you say would be um, some of the most surprising discoveries you've had across your career with your work? Oh, heavens above, surprising discoveries. I think um, it's interesting. I mean, I loved doing docos originally um, because you just get paid to meet extraordinary people mm. uh, in extraordinary places, which is an enormous privilege. Mm. Um, I'm a great traveller, so it, um, that was part of the reason for getting into sound recording for me, so to actually get to go on wonderful journeys was great. And then I, uh, they stopped taking sound recordists with them, which is quite annoying. So, so uh, that's when I decided to get into drama because mm -hmm. I do also enjoy watching actors. 
you and they do an extraordinary process. Yeah, absolutely. And have you found that there have been um, some key co like collaborators that you've worked with across across the breadth of your career? Uh, there have been. I can't stress enough how important it is to have mentors. Mm. In life. They are really, really important. Uh, I've had a couple of key mentors um, who really have been instrumental in my career. How did you How did you find those mentors? Like actually find them? Find them um, through. I was lucky enough working at, at AFTRS in Melbourne to check out who everybody was. I would often run courses that I was interested in. I must say. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, but. Um, I, I, as like Erica, was lucky enough to benefit from some of the women's funding that was out there. When uh, digital came in, um, I applied for a grant from what was in the uh, AFC, Australian Film Commission, mm -hmm. to hire tech, the digital equipment and to find a post-production person who could mentor me through the process of learning how to record properly on digital gear. And that wow. was Greg Carter, who was fantastic. Wow. Mm. Yeah, technology has changed a fair bit, hasn't it? Mm. <laughs> so, well, he was wonderful. Um, my first big break was, believe it or not, doing a Jackie Chan film. So, <laughs> Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and honestly, I was, um, I was, at, I was on the dolls as you are, as you do skiing at Falls Creek, watching these sets being helicoptered across mountains, thinking, God, I'll never work on anything like that. And three weeks later, I was walked in the door and the phone was ringing, as we had home phones in those days. And um, I'd walked in from a dog food commercial, I think, and the phone was ringing, and it was my mentor, Craig, and he said, a woman called Barbie's going to ring you, you're going to say yes, and then ring me back and panic. <laughs> <laughs> say yes first, panic later. Okay. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I did. Barbie rang and said, um, can you be in Brisbane in two days to record the Jackie Chan film. Phenomenal. Wow. So wow. Now, I want to come back to that story, um, but I'm getting the wind up, so I'm going to need to keep moving, but I definitely want to come back and hear more of, of this whole journey. But thank you. Thank you for that, Gretchen, and we'll talk to you in a moment. Well, okay, so we are now, I'm going to now introduce Fiona Donovan, who started out as an architect and then moved into set and costume design through her studies at NIDA and has worked on some of a whole range of Australia's most iconic shows. So from the list that is also extensive, we have A Place to Call Home, the second season of Frayed, Back to the Rafters, the reboot, Between Two Worlds, Ascendant, Young Lions, Crownies, Love Child, Truth, The Shallows, and Pacific Rim Uprising. <laughs> so, Fiona, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so lovely oh, to have thank you. you for good having to see me. you again. Yes, it's so good to see you too, Rosie. Yep. It's been a while. Um, thank, you. thank you for having me. Oh, no, my God. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, uh, same question for anyone who might be a bit confused about what what the art department does exactly in tech i'm actually wanting to see if we can break this down into two different sections with you in technical terms what how would you describe what you do and then from a story perspective how would you describe it uh, so uh i think eric erica talked about capturing the image we we so i always say what when people say what do the art department do it's i say not the actors not what they're wearing but everything else that you see the art department is responsible for. So it's the physical environment and even not the physical environment. So I'll, uh, in collaboration with the DRP, we put practical lights into set. Um, so practical lights, we do everything that you see. So like behind me, I do be responsible for the wall, the pictures, the mirror, the fittings on the, and if I was holding a cup, I'm responsible for the cup, probably the ear pod. So it's, are you, it's the physical environment. Um, it does, now bleed more into the non, you know, the visual effects environment too. It depends on the scale of the project. Mm. And as far as the story goes, um, I think every aspect of filmmaking is about collaboration. So for me, it's about reading the script, talking to the key key creatives, and um, sitting down and working out what is the story we're trying to tell. And my job is to visually underpin that visually support it, provide the scaffolding. And sometimes you end up doing a lot more than what you see, but that actually 
helps helps create the environment for the actors in the world to be in. So yeah, it's like a, it's a, a I think of it as scaffolding for the a visual storytelling as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Because um, it would even go down to as far as like if there was a note on the table, the script oh, on yeah. that note and all yeah. of the bits and pieces, the minute detail through to the big stuff yeah. as well. Yeah. So with that note, we'd actually ask the writers, what do you want on the note? Because if it gets seen specifically, it, either it's really important if it's a court drama or if it's a mm -hmm. suicide note, it might end up being featured and you might end up seeing it in different stages, uh, like it might be freshly written and, and you won't see it in order. And so, you know, like it can be quite the level of detail that you end up, it's the macro and the micro world. And it so supports each other. I think it's really important to have, to understand the big picture as well as the tiny detail that, because at the end of the day, it's about, it's about the focusing in on what the story is. And often it's about, what the actor is telling you and also what the world is telling you as well. So, yeah. How was your, what's been your journey through to the beginning? Where did you start and how did you yeah. end up in this career? So I uh, actually started as a classical musician. <laughs> I was a cellist and I got to the end of school and it sounds bizarre, but I did a lot of classical music and I was completely immersed in this world. And, and I thought I could go on and do, I actually got into study and then went, Actually, I feel like I need more than that. And my friend and my mother was an art teacher by correspondence. And she said, what about architecture? Because it's about the physical environment. And you, it teaches you to think. And I think, I think that's been a part of everything I've done. I've always extended myself. I keep learning. So I, I, that was really great sort of foundation. So I just did three years of architecture. And in my third year, I did a... I did, a, I did a design for a show for a youth theatre and I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, I've spent all this time doing these drawings and building models and suddenly something I've designed is there. So I said to the guy I was working with, where can you do this? And he was like, NIDA. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> yeah, <good question. laughs> No idea. Applied, got in, couldn't believe it. So I went to NIDA and did NIDA. And in second year was so lucky Roger Ford and Janet Patterson came and did a project with us and I was just hooked. I, don't, I was already hooked on film and television, but I was like, I want to do that. So I did an attachment with Roger Ford in third year. And um, when I graduated, it was like, what am I going to do? And some of the people that I met on that attachment started giving me little bits of work. And then I wrote 52 letters out of the production book. I had three replies and one was a job. So this is pre-computers. So wow. the guy who gave me the job was also a NIDA graduate. You can do that. You can do anything. So I started as a runner on Spellbinder Series 1. And you like I just, I was so Spellbinder. <laughs> it was so amazing. Heather Mitchell is so awesome. Oh, I love Heather. So I, I kind of had this tandem thing going. It's really interesting to hear that two previous panel, panellists, you kind of have to have this tandem thing going. I tried to get in at the ABC because the ABC used to have design. It used to really have this program of training people. And I knew people who'd got in as uh, assistant designers and I thought that's a really good thing to do. So I kind of was doing this tandem thing of being a runner, being a prop spy, and then got in at the ABC and you were, I was a designer or a design assistant and I worked on play school and wild side and I, I kind of had... You kind, of, you kind of bent, and then I got into features as a draft person because of my architecture, so a set designer. So you have all these tandem things going, and as as I built up my set of skills, um, I kind of then ended up at the ABC for 10 years. There was a downturn in the industry, and I kind of ended up on these rolling contracts for 10 years, working on play school and doing other sets. And it actually was really good to hone my craft Um because I've still got a script, I still work with a director and I still have to produce stuff. So it was still like it really honed my craft and then um, start, then came out again and was art directing and then from there, um, art directing, all big things, little things, did a kids show in China and then um, was really lucky to take on a place to call home and sort of then took the leap into production designing full time, which has just been a gift. And you did such a beautiful job with it. It's oh, such a gorgeous you. show. It's such oh, a gorgeous I, 
so much fun. It was so much fun. Yeah. Well, you can tell. I think I think that's something that's really wonderful about filmmaking. You can see when someone's heart's in their work and whether it is the sound recording or whether it's the production design or whether it's editing that we'll talk about next or obviously the cinematography. Um, when someone's passionate about the story and the world and the characters and the journey that they're, they're going on, you can, it just seeps through. Um, yeah. What have you found has been a, a surprising discovery across your career? Um, I really want to say that, you know, the difference between A Place to Call Home and Maelstrom Pacific Rim was there was no difference. I approached, I did, like, I, I was so lucky to do that job because doing robots, you'd think that they're, they're worlds apart, but the attention to detail is still there. And I was so surprised at how much fun that was. What I love about this job is the collaboration and um, it's, it's, and you're all in. Like, you, it's your heart and your soul you put into it. And, and for one, one minute, you're in the 50s and that's everything you're doing. And the next thing you're like, trying to imagine what it's like to be the most richest person in Australia or what is it like to be a woman who's destitute and lives is built this massive robot and how would that actually work and mm. you you know it's like you're always trying to find the underpinning and the support for what the story is and I think that it's these explorations of different lives and different worlds that's just so fascinating and then all the amazing people you get to meet along the way like the crazy guy who collects typewriters or the, you know, the person who has every single lawnmower and knows every single brand or, you know, it's just like the things that, and the people that you come across who are so passionate about that little niche thing is just amazing. Yeah. Phenomenal. And have you found, have you found that um, uh, you've worked with the same people across, across your career or like that you've found that oh. people from very early have come back again and, and the interweaving of the threads? I think that there's kind of a build up. You kind of end up building up more and more and more and more contacts. And it's interesting having taken that leap into production design. Uh, it's a different set of contacts. So I think uh, part of me, like I did two short films at film school when I finished. Uh, but it's, I wish I'd gone to film school because I think those contacts are so fantastic. But I've still built a career on that. So you tend to come across the same people and then you suddenly meet a new person you go wow we've had this parallel life and then we've worked with these similar people mm -hmm. and so you you know and you find I think you find commonality there some yeah so yeah, but, yeah. phenomenal okay all right I'm going to leave it there for a moment Fiona Thank and you. I'm going to go talk to Mel but then we'll all come back together again so I would love to introduce Melanie Annan. She is an editor and has been working in Australia across short films, TV series and features and has been working across a wonderful range of projects, including At Home with Julia, Low Life, High Life, Cancelled and I Met a Girl, that whole series, the Something Fishy, Dana, Australian Summer, Despite the Gods, Waiting for a Miracle to Come. Um, and of course, and many more than that as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Melanie. It's so lovely to meet you. Not a problem. Yes, thanks for having me. And that was great hearing from everyone else. <laughs> oh, everyone's so incredible. Just the, the journeys that everyone's been on and the insight into what they do is just, it's so, so incredibly um, uh, rich. It's so rich. So yeah. on that. I'd love for anyone who might not understand what an editor does, obviously it's been alluded to already, but how would you describe it? Uh, yes. So as Erica said, it is almost like the final draft of the script. So what we do is get uh, all the footage that everyone else has worked so hard to capture um, and we end up getting all that footage into the edit suite and putting it together. Yeah, so after sometimes hundreds of crew have um, captured this footage, then it's just usually like one person just sitting there quite daunting, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you work it out with the director. That's the uh, closest collaborator. No. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, some people think, what do you, what are you doing? Just chopping all the um, bad bits out. I'm like, well, it's yeah, a bit more than that. So you're just, you might restructure or uh, different things like that. And by restructure, do you mean, just for anyone else who's listening in, do you mean like maybe rearranging the order of scenes or maybe taking moments from things and piecing them somewhere else or 
shifting what dialogue around a little bit yeah yeah that's right so it might be a case of um some dialogue isn't needed anymore like once you know we see the production design sound cinematography it says so much you might find uh some dialogue isn't isn't needed or when you sit down and watch it all in a row you might think hey this scene isn't needed which is always sad or you might think let's rearrange this could come a bit earlier people might need this information sooner so yeah it's just sitting there and as everyone else has said so yeah you're serving the story and um yeah trying to get all the emotion across fascinating so it's almost like a giant puzzle but you where you can rearrange all those pieces and it still can link together to make a story I guess the clearest version of the story of the director's vision as possible that's right, yeah, serving that vision and sometimes I think of it like a bit like Tetris. Yeah. With emotions or something, playing Tetris with emotions, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Um, yeah, so you're really just piecing it all together, you know, hopefully being able to do some screenings with audiences and getting feedback all along the way from producers and everyone else on the crew, yeah. Phenomenal. And how did you start in all of this crazy industry? Uh, I did, I was also working at, I was working in an office um, at a documentary company here in Perth. Uh, I'm not quite sure what I want, not knowing I wanted to do film and TV, but not 100% sure. I mean, I think I edited my friend's music videos and things. But then I met all the editors working there in this documentary company and I sort of gravitated towards that and after hours I would be the assistant. Um, but yeah, eventually I went to film school as well and Yes, as everyone has said, that's a great place to get contacts. Um, and I'm yeah, still working with some of those people. Amazing. Can uh, I backtrack for a split mm. second from it then? You just mentioned the role of being an assistant to the editor. Mm. What does the assistant do? Um, so as the assistant, I was, I was uh, logging all the footage, so organising it when it comes in, digitising it, uh, organising it all for the editor, so hopefully they can just come in and start editing, syncing the footage. Uh, so should, gonna, just because we're talking about the technical terms and people yeah. might not necessarily know them. So logging them is um, ingesting them digitally and then um, putting, giving them the right names for the right files and then yeah. sorting them into the right bins and the right folders. Yeah, that's right. Like I think people have all seen the um, clapper, which will have the shot name, the take name. So it's just organising it all. So each, so we know that where all the shots for the same scene are put into one bin. And then nowadays it's a bit automatic, but um, in those days you'd also have to sync the sound and audio, uh, sorry, sound and picture together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's yeah. so that then dialogue is, so the sound, what you hear of is actually in sync with what's coming out of an arm. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So you yeah. you'd do all that for the editor so they can just get started. Phenomenal. And then going through once you started working on your own projects, obviously you've had prop best films and award-winning short films and then through the web series and then through the uh, features and TV shows, what navigating all of that journey, how did that kind of happen? Um, yeah, so I did a, yeah, a lot of short films. I'm still doing a lot of short films that I quite like doing. It. Um, oh, and God. And I, it, it, it's kind of the irony that that's what a people's supposed entry point is. Sometimes it's harder to tell a story in a short period of time. Yeah, than it is. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've done a lot of short films and uh, I've done a lot of reality shows like Bondi Rescue and um, those kind of renovation, house renovation. And all. I think I sort of did everything for a while. Um, and now I'm focusing more sort of on indie dramas and, um, yeah, see seeing what other opportunities came up. I went to the US as well and worked there for eight years. That's why I've kept doing short films because it feels when you move countries, you sort of start afresh Mm -hmm. Um, and short films are a good way to do that. Yeah, so a bit of everything really, yeah. Fabulous. And now from your your list here, you've worked with Luke a lot. Um, Yeah. How did that collaboration start? um, For everyone who doesn't know, Luke is a a director who, uh, did low life and high life and cancelled and I met a girl so that's a uh, web series web series web series feature um, and has just had recancelled uh, announced yeah. I'm doing I've, that's what I was just doing this morning actually oh, where are you okay um, wonderful good <laughs> um 
yeah, well, we met at film. We met at film school, so we worked together on short films at film school. We probably worked on maybe five short films, and then the web series. And it's like quite a good trajectory because then, um, thanks to the web series, the feature happened as well. So yeah, um, yes. And as Erica was saying, the best thing about that once you work with someone over all those productions is it's a bit of a shorthand. It's, yeah, especially in the edit suite, especially mm -hmm. working remotely. Yeah, which I do sometimes. Yeah, sort of, yeah it, make, it makes it all a bit quicker. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the whole of Cancelled was created whilst they were in lockdown in Spain. That's and right, yeah. Quite <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> amazing. Um, and how, like, have you had any surprising discoveries across this journey so far? Um, yeah, I was wondering if I would get that question. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure. I, I mean, I think, yeah, the passion that's, there especially uh yeah in short films and people's first films all that passion is just really contagious and um yeah just how important every single role on set is to, mm. to what I get in the end um yeah things like that have been really rewarding mm. it's really fascinating so I, I didn't go to film school I I went to drama school and, and trained as an actor um and then and then um, started started producing things. And I was blown away by how dedicated every single person was to telling the story and what each of the different departments um, added and contributed to that mm -hmm. melting pot of story. And then one of the really key, like I, and every step of the way that that was, that was the case. And then when I sat in the edit suite with the editor on the first project that I was working on, that was Adrian Powers with Skin Deep, I was just mesmerized by the magic he he found within the performances and what the rearranging did and and just um the story that he found was absolutely the final draft of that script that yeah. I just I had never known how integral or how um I actually I think I, I honestly feel that editors deserve much more credit than they get given in the <laughs> industry it's a phenomenal job that you do um, yeah. And to be able to find those secret looks or the twinkle in an eye somewhere or the take or the, that random bird that's flying through a shot yeah. that tells, that contributes to a thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Like, I think when I first did it, it yeah, I was like, what? This is so much fun. Like, yeah. <laughs> I get to see yeah. all this. For the, I'm the first person to see all this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like you're an investigator interrogating every little piece of footage for how best yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I might bring everybody back for um, our full panel Q&A. So if everyone would like to turn their cameras and their microphones on, we have a very um, quiet, shy, or maybe enthralled audience today who haven't actually put any questions in our Q&A box. So I'm just going to keep asking questions from everybody. And again, everyone who's watching, if something comes up that I have missed or I'm missing, just please chuck it in the box. We're keeping eyes on it here. Um, what I would love to know, and this is going to be in no particular order, but how each of you work with each of the different departments here. So how do we want to do this best? Maybe we should start with generally who... Who comes on first? So obviously, Mel, you'll come on later because you're in the post department. But do and so, Erica, designer. Yeah. Okay. So great. So Fiona, you'd come on first, and you'd work with yeah. the director first. Mm. Yeah. Can you and, probably, and, yeah. Well, I I often find they get the DP in. I'll start talking the DOP at at the beginning. But you're we are one of the first people on because it's the where the the big black hole of where all the money could go. And I think it's everyone is quite mystified by the art department in some ways. So it's really good to kind of, um yeah, and that that and everyone gets very nervous about what we might end up doing. <laughs> so I find that I'm very clearly communicate with everybody. So there's often a conversation that happens with the key creatives so um, DOP, costume designer, makeup, director, producer, whoever's created the show. Um, the best thing we could possibly do, which we did on Freight, is we all got in a room together for a day. We'd had a conversation, which was a visual conversation, throwing images around. The DOP and I swapped books and 
this is my favourite book and I'm thinking about this. And then we collected all these images and then put together a tone document and talked about how we're going to approach it. And it was like approach visually how we're going to approach the whole project. And at the same time, there's the conversations about all the other ways they're going to approach it. So um, I find communication is so important and um, I put together a lot, like I, not only do I talk, but I put together lots of images or um, I put together a little document us for the tech recce and ask the tech recce exactly what we're going to do, giving plans to everybody. I always talk about colours and there's also, um, I always make sure if we do uh, camera tests, I throw lots of things in there. It doesn't matter what happens. It's really good to see what happens to the colours when they put the, the grade or the LUT on because it changes in ways you don't expect. And mm -hmm. the more you put in there, the more you can understand. And it's like just this constant conversation between myself and everyone. So, and as we're shooting, I'm on set every morning talking to everybody as well. Is it all okay? Is this going okay? And then I'm watching rushes and yeah. Sorry. Wonderful. Just for anyone who's not sure what a LUT is, um, Erica, do you want to describe what a LUT is quickly? And then actually, Fiona, I'd like to come back to you to ask another question on that. Sure. Um, LUT stands for a lookup table. And what it does is um, it, uh, it translates what is actually coming into the camera into a particular overall quality of colour and um, and uh, density. So um, so you can you can change things a lot with a LUT and um, um, and it's the it's used to give a look that is supposed to be or is intended to be the look that will be there at the end of the project. So everyone can see it at the get-go at the time of shooting, at the time of editing and at the time of release. It should all be the same. Wonderful. So it's almost like um, a pre-made grade um that mm. can be put in early um yep. so that when it finally gets to the colorist at the end they can then obviously make their magic with specific detail but early you can see not just raw footage but something that's a little bit prettier or has the density and the yeah so you know if if the intention is for for the overall sort of look of of um the film to be sort of in amber tones then you would not necessarily light it with amber tones that much you would you could potentially create that through the LUT which would then just put that color into the footage mm. phenomenal thanks erica mm -hmm. fiona i want to just come back to you for a second when you're working with a director what do you like to how do you like to start that conversation? Do you like the director to give you a document of possibly the images that they have in their brain that they're inspired by or references to other shows and other um, movies or even artists? Like what, what works for you? It's, it's all of those things or none of those things because I think everybody and every relationship you have is quite different. So yeah. some directors come with a very specific idea in mind and others like want you to lead them and give them all the options so they can work it out. And you know, working and I've worked with a couple of first time directors who are just so overwhelmed by everything. You kind of have to take it, take it very slowly and gently, and help them help them along with the process. And then other people you've worked with for a while, you do you have that wonderful shorthand. And but I find that most projects always have a reference point. It's a combination of this show and this show and this show, or you, you all talk about shows you've seen that make feel like where you're going but aren't necessarily what you're actually doing. But mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. But visually, I use a lot of visual. I think because it's, it's colour and mood and the visual support. So you want to show pictures and images because that's that how do you convey the emotion otherwise and what are we trying to do and, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And so then, Erica, you get joined into the mix once there's once this conversation has started. Is that right? Usually, it's um, it's in my experience the um, the designer has been on well in advance, um, yeah. and um, but it's the it's the same territory. So it's um, it's finding um, common ground of how um, you think that the picture is going to end up looking and feeling. Um, and um, and just while you were talking, Fiona, I just went, oh, that's right. I remember seeing in um, um, The Dry, which is a beautifully photographed film. If you haven't seen it yet, go out and see it, um, based on the book of the same title. But there's a moment in when I saw first saw the film where um, um, Eric Banner's character 
is um, staying overnight in, in the town of his um, when he was a child and he stays in the hotel and he walks into the hotel room. It's, it's not a, it's a fairly low rent hotel and he turns the light on and I just went, oh, it's an Edward Hopper painting. It was so clearly <laughs> one of the references in that production and it was one of the most beautiful realisations that I've seen, not of a, of a specific Edward Hopper painting, but of the quality of his paintings. And yeah. that's the kind of thing that, um, um, that you know, I've heard other cinematographers talk about, you know, when they've, um, they just, they have particular paintings and particular visual, you know, photographers work that they use as springboards, as inspirations in um, how to create the look and the mood and the feel. So, um, yes. a ramble. yeah, anyway. We have a question in the Q&A box around um, talking through colour palettes and the choice of the books. And I guess it's probably also a question for Fiona because um, colour also is art department as well. Um, but ultimately where how light plays on the colour is going to go through camera and then ultimately to the grade. But around eliciting different psychological reactions or responses or emotions, um, how do you start with that conversation? How does that how does that play out for you with the director? I think it all comes back from um, back to the script and what kind of um, world is the story world set in. So, is it a sunny world? Is it a claustrophobic world? Is it a is it a sad? Is it a you know what are the qualities? What are the emotional um, tones of the story? Um, and what's the journey? So it might start in a in a dark place and finish in a light place, or conversely. Um, and um, and it's a process of of really really knowing the script. And I think that you can't know your script too well. You need yeah. to know what's what's at stake for your characters you know what's driving them what are their motivations why are they doing what what do they want to get and um, um and and then responding to that information about what's driving the characters what kind of world do they actually live in and um and how can you what are the colors that resonate for you for me that will express that and finding common ground with director and designer Mm, mm. it's incredible color is one of the most complex things in the whole world in my humble opinion um others may disagree with me it's infinite um it can be varied infinitely um and of course it changes on every screen that we watch whatever we watch on um so it's um it's one of those um relentless pursuits of perfection you know for uh, the appropriateness for for a story to get the right colors and the right um quality to those colors um and to have them come out correctly at the end as imagined which is no mean feat because there's a lot of hands and a lot of technologies that those that the data passes through from the time of shooting to the time of being shown on a screen somewhere. And um, there's a lot of um, a lot of people who can get in there and manipulate the files. Mm. So control is one of the things that um, cinematographers constantly aspire to have. And mm. sometimes we do and sometimes we don't over the colour. Yeah, wow. I wish we had a colorist on here to talk further about this because this is absolutely fascinating. It's really complex. It's really rich and it's really important. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, wonderful. We actually have a question here that's for everybody that I would, um, that I was intrigued by as well. So thank you for asking it, Alessia, um, around the fact that all four of you started by doing some work in the industry in different ways, but then ultimately did go to film school to then uh, or did I get that? Did I get that confused? Not everybody went to film school. No, I didn't. I worked there, but I didn't ever go. You worked there. That's no. right. No, I didn't go to film school. Oh no, you didn't either, Fiona. You went. You no. through architecture yeah. and then out again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so then it. So, Erica, you ended up going to film school, and then Melanie, you went to film school. Yeah. Yes. Um, do you feel like that was, what were your drivers for that? Was that an industry pressure that you felt like that was the best pathway in or was that a personal choice for reasons of your own that you? Yeah, I think um, for me, it was a personal choice. Um, I suppose being over in Perth as well, I was like, it would be good to go, you know, go to Sydney for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I, that was 20 years, 20 years ago now. So I think it's a bit, different and I don't want anyone to think oh I've got to go to film I think it's more expensive too but so I don't want anyone to think oh I've, the only way in is through film school 
Um, but yeah, I think there's other path, everyone has a different pathways and having a mentor or working on short films and things like that would definitely be another way to go. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Erica, with you, um, you ended up going to film school too. I did. Um, I was strongly encouraged by um, two people, um, one of whom was Julian Armstrong and the other was Jeff Burton, who both said to me very clearly, go. They just and, and everybody else around me said, oh, you wouldn't want to do that. They were very disparaging. So mm -hmm. I had sort of like two completely different. So but I'd already worked for several years you know, sort of as a you know, baby assistant. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and what I can absolutely say is that what you learn in film school, it's almost impossible to learn um, in the industry. And what you learn in industry is absolutely impossible to learn at film school. So mm -hmm. they're complementary. Um, and, um, um, and what I say in, in my teaching is that to everybody who's enrolled in a film course, it's a gift that you're giving yourself to have time to experiment and investigate where the stakes are extremely low and you can really badly, you know, sort of make terrible errors and there's not much um, negative will come back from that. And in fact, you'll probably learn an enormous amount. So it's incredibly important while you're at film school to, um, to really go out, go out as far as you can because you'll never go out that far again professionally, most likely. Yeah, and particularly, I guess, um, as technology has changed um, across time as well to be able to play with new tools and new toys and see how they each of those you work and what the different learnings and benefits are each and have you found that um, as technology has changed that you wish that you could potentially go back to film school again to go and just play with things or do you I guess after having such a, an extensive career you've got the the a bit of a, a buffer where you do get to play with things now um, I don't get to play that much, but um, but I've had the um, the benefit of um, um, mentoring and encouraging students a lot, and and looking very closely at the fruits of their labours and investigations. So that's been <clears throat> part of part of my learning journey is to um, is to say, right, well, you don't know if these two cameras are actually going to cut together, all right. Let's shoot some test material. That when I say let's, that means you will shoot some <laughs> test material and cut it together and grade it. And do they sit together? So, um, so it's a constant process of um, of investigation. But um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's a really wonderful point in terms of the um, the the benefits of mentorships and and how the mentorship can go both directions. It's not always that the most experienced person has all of the wisdom to tell because people you get to play with different things and um, obviously now is a very different time to be starting in the industry than it was when you started, Erica. Yes, um. I roll my eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the most amazing things is that the calibre of the technology that everyone is now working with is astonishing compared mm. to what it was when I started um, a very long time ago working with celluloid. And, yeah. um, you know, everybody grades with Resolve now. And, um, and you know, when, when I was working on projects and we were grading with Resolve, um, we'd book so many hours in the, um, in the facility that had the operator and the room and the Resolve in it. And, um, and it was, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour, and, you know, I think like $600 an hour. Um, and, um, and everybody's got it for free on their laptop. So, and it's extraordinary and it's way better now than it was back then. So um, we, we do have access, everyone has one way or another. The, the playing field is far more egalitarian and, um, and level now than it ever was. One of the things that um, Branford Masalis talks about in a really wonderful documentary, I saw him talking about his um, background before um, becoming a cinematographer. When he was at film school, so he's a, um, I think he's an Oscar winning um, black African, uh, black American cinematographer. Um, when he was at film school, um, shooting on film was a barrier for the poor students because they couldn't afford to buy film. Yeah. So it was really problematic. He said, you know, if you were really kind of like, you know, sort of in, in sort of clever, you could, you could steal a roll of film from somewhere so you could get your hands on it if you actually stole it, literally. But there was this gatekeeper of the laboratories who you could not 
get past. You had to have money to get to the laboratory to get your film processed. So there was a real class divide um, at film school. And that class barrier is very different now these days, which is fantastic. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. And that's obviously not to say that there are no divides, but um, that thankfully they're, they're getting smaller and we're all working a little butts off to try and even get those evened out as well. So one step forward. Yes. Yeah. Um, Gretchen, I wanted to ask how technology has affected your department and particularly with the on-set recording. Oh, enormously, particularly now. I've got to say that I'm rather happy I'm on the tail end rather than the start because so much of what we do is wireless technology these days and uh, that little spectrum is becoming more and more crowded. It's almost, I was reading the other day, somebody in America is saying that they actually have to have a full-time person uh, constantly chasing frequencies to be able to find a gap on set where they can actually put a radio mic because the spectrum's just been sold off to the highest bidder, basically, which is what happened here, happened to me. Um, you know, I, I invested about 50 grand in some radio mics for Saddle Club, of all things, and um, the government sold off that frequency range, so they're illegal to use. So that's, I don't, you know, not many people have 40 grand sitting around in which to throw away an investment so it can be a bit of a problem yeah. uh, but I, something I think I need to say is a lot of women are put off by technology it's important to understand if you can read you can be technical just read the manual it's really mm. not hard it's yeah. uh, I just you know whenever I'm stuck with something I think oh god how am I going to get out of this and I think that oh, manual gonna have a read it's a day when you have to actually read it on set but you know you can slide under something <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's important to know that if you can read you can get yourself out of a technical problem yeah and also you know having mentors that you can on the end of the phone and say quick how do I get out of this one um mm. and that's a big thing I was going to say too about when you're learning um it takes about at least 10 years to get to any one of the positions that we're in now so please remember that <laughs> you can't do it at the end of your attachment, um, <laughs> and um, and mm. you know it takes a it takes a, a lot of of time to understand. And the difference between us and people moving into the industry is that we all have a plan B, a C, and a D, and we don't leave, leave home without them. And I think that's an important thing to know about people in technical positions. Mm. And what would you mean by plans A, B, C, and D? Uh, well, if this is, doesn't work, <laughs> what oh, yes. about reserve if that doesn't work? Um, and do you mean by in terms of the mic might be faulty, or there's a cable, or the recording device, or there are no frequencies, or or you know the best, the most fabulous looking location that's been totally dressed is next to the railway line. Yeah. Uh, suddenly, <laughs> just to get the road outside and all those sort of issues that <laughs> you've got to have a plan B and C for. Yeah, for anyone who's coming in Sydney, no doubt, or in most places, aeroplanes, obviously, mm. um, and busy traffic and humming fridges that you're not allowed to turn off and... All those things, lockdown. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can tell you there's been no planes, <laughs> no traffic. It was, it's been good. Yeah, exactly. The lockdown last year, that was quite an interesting time for us all. Yeah. Yes, yeah, wow. Enough to work. <laughs> Somehow, Neighbours was considered essential. There you go. Yeah. Well, even, even like across the US and the UK, the entertainment industries kept working. They were essential in industries, but they were being monitored. Um, yeah, I've got a friend who's working in Canada at the moment, and their set was shut down for a week because one of the hairdressers tested positive to COVID. Um, but thankfully, they 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 have protocols in place where they're looking after people's safety. And anyone who saw Tom Cruise um, very rightly get angry at the crew for not obeying those protocols. Um, people yeah people have been taking it seriously and they have been looking for ways to make sure that our industry globally has been able to keep keep moving forward to keep people employed and keep people entertained really um it's a tough world out there at the moment hmm. there's, there's a complete thirst for content though like everyone That's is busy like we thought it was just australia but actually around the world is really busy because it's just content the demand for content is so great I think Gretchen's point about having a plan A through to Z is it's like you kind of need that just not for when I go to work, what if, it's the what if 
Google is your friend. Having people you can ring is great. But also for your career as well. When I first started out, I used to have other jobs that weren't just in the film industry. So I could, that I could, there was a, I built in a flexibility. So I always had a backup. And as I got, I got to the point where the backup, I had to let go of the backup. And um, you also kind of need to build a little platform to work from financially. And, you know, sometimes you do jobs because it's a, you're economically driven. Like most of my career has been economically driven. I've not been supported by anyone. I didn't get, have a partner till much later in life. So everything I did myself. So everything was about how am I going to get? So as you're starting out, you kind of build up you, I love that word scaffolding around you and like my one of the best bits of advice I've ever had was just make sure your outgoings aren't more than your incoming so when you first start out you want to make sure you can just be live it as meagerly as you can and you might go gosh that's an amazing paycheck you got to put it aside for when you're not working so and then you kind of do that with everything so you kind of build up your contacts and it's just build it slowly building up your career so yeah. and it's Look, your contacts, the people that you work with that you least expect are the ones that are actually going to help you out down the track. And the industry is very small and you will encounter all those people again. So just remember that too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Mel, that's an, I think that's an incredibly important thing. I'm just going to jump in and say absolutely. It's a tiny industry and um, um, try not to completely piss off anybody. Yes. Yeah. That's well, very that's hard, crazy. but try. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't burn your bridges. Correct. But do stand up for yourself. Like it's also important exactly. not to let bad behaviour be oh. treated as the, the auto bad behaviour is not acceptable. And that thankfully has really shifted from when I first started to, and even in the, the as Me Too happened, I noticed this amazing shift, <laughs> which was so wonderful and was so... And there's another shift happening at the moment, which is fantastic. But it, you just, you know, know when to stand your ground and know when to say you don't accept bad behaviour. But at that very moment, it might not be the time. Just be very mindful of your reputation when you go ahead and say your piece. But don't not, don't not say your piece. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. Absolutely. I wanted to um, just go back to the point you were making when you first started chatting to Sam Fiona around being able to like balance out your life but particularly as we're all starting out in the industry um and we don't necessarily get offered jobs that have, have much money attached to them um or any money attached to them melanie that we you haven't been i wanted to get your thoughts on this in particular um uh, yeah as others have mentioned i mean the advice i got one day is yeah you try to set yourself up try to set yourself up so you can take those opportunities when they happen. So yeah, maybe try to save a little nest egg. Or for me, what I was doing is, yeah, working in reality TV. Yeah, um, so I always had that to fall back on. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I would say. But yeah, I mean, I think it's important to take on those jobs at the, at the beginning of your career. I mean, they might be unpaid even, but I mean, I did a lot of that at the start and you know, eventually you're going to work your way up or as a team you're going to end up getting bigger jobs all together. Yeah. Can I jump in and ask a question? Mm -hmm. Because um, um, Gretchen, you mentioned having invested $50,000 in um, microphones. That's a really significant investment. Um, and I'm interested to know, and I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg, there's a whole lot more, um, but I'm interested, Melanie, to know if you've invested in equipment. Um, yeah, well, I've been, yeah, just the editing software, which used to be a lot more, and now they get you because it's a monthly fee, so they do get you, but it's like, I have Premiere and Avid, so that's like two lots of $30 a month that you end up, that you end up spending, so, but, it, you know, it probably pales in comparison to equipment, because I'm just getting, oh, a laptop, but I guess I have that anyway, but yeah, so a little, a little bit of investing but often on feature films you'll get if I am using my own computer then I'll get a little bit of money towards it but mm. I yeah I think it's getting cheaper and cheaper now so that's probably a good thing yeah mm. so Erica reflecting the question back to you have you invested in your own equipment and cameras and lenses and all the and tripods and mm. the parapalia 
yes, it's come and it's gone. Um, so I now have um, sort of one light bulb and I think, oh, probably I should get a little bit more. Um, I don't, you know, I had, um, I had a film camera, I had digital cameras, I've had tripods, lights, and, um, and then I've just gradually divested all of that. And partly that's because um, it all changes so quickly that I just went, I just got to a point where I went, I'm not going to invest anymore. I'm just going, mm. you know, it's just going to be higher. The production companies quite often have their own equipment that they want to use um, or a particular platform that they want um, the project to be shot on. Um, and, you know, everything has to be shot on 4K now. Um, and um, even though a lot, of, you know, a lot of things are still shot on Amiras and Alexas, which are 3.2K. Um, so, you know, there's just so many choices about what to, to actually shoot on. It's kind of relentless and, um, I've just, just moved right away from it and I've, I've got yeah. a light meter. I've got three light meters. Okay. Yep. Three light meters. That makes sense. Yeah. I want to ask, this is mirrored in the, in our chat box as well, for anyone who might not have the opportunity to go to a film school, might not have the funds, the resources, the time available to them. For all four of you, what would be your advice in terms of places and ways that they can learn? Obviously learning on set and collaborating with other people and making a range of short films is an incredible thing to do. But again, not everyone has that luxury, particularly if they're living remotely or they might not have the time. In terms of some of that learning that people can do by themselves in building towards making a project with other people, are there books or webinars or master classes or particular people who you might follow online um, or documentaries that people would for each of your different departments that you would people look into? Um, like I think we all touched on, I think mentorship's a good idea, but yeah, um, we'll go back to that one. Mm. But I think, I mean, for editing anyway, it would be maybe contacting the Australian Screen Editors Guild that, you know, you can go to events there and a lot of them are online now, which is much better, I think, for um, yeah, everyone being in a different state. Um, yeah, I think I'd try to do that kind of thing. And then the main thing would, yeah, would be finding finding people who and just doing doing all these short films and things like that. So... I'll have a, I'll post a link if I can think of any particular books, but I think it's mostly just getting out there and trying to do it. And yeah. the film schools sometimes have short courses as well, yeah. which might be a bit easier to do. And sure. some of those short courses are online as well um, through the film schools. Mm. And so, and actually Mel, this question specifically was asked of you. So in terms of being an editor, so if you do think of any of those links, it would be great to, even if you think of them afterwards, then maybe, mm -hmm. The Screenworks team can send them out to people just if anything comes yeah. to mind. And um, I think, yeah, with mentors, I mean, I've got some, my own mentors too, but it, it's probably just looking at different people's work and careers and picking someone, you know, who, who you think is working on something that you'd like to do in a few years' time. And I, I think most people in the film industry here in Australia would be quite easy to reach out to. And that they, they would probably be yeah willing to talk to you and give advice. Yeah, there was just recently the mentorship opportunity through Women in Film and TV in collaboration with the Gender Matters Task Force. Um, all of those um, positions have been um, allocated, but that's looking at being uh, possibly happening again next year. And um, other organisations do some more formal mentorships that provide a structure that would be useful. But sometimes it is also hard to. Mm -hmm. Do the cold email and just be like, "Hi, I'm a bit of a fan. Please buy <laughs> <try> my message," <laughs> which can be also can be tricky. Um, I think uh, Melanie's right. Though, that, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think Melanie's right though. Like, I actually get quite a lot of people email me. I always take the time to email back, and even if they're starting out or partway through their career, like if you saw the dry and you like the dry and you're a designer, contact Ruby Mavis. Find out where she is. Write her an email, get to know her, ask her about a process. She she would be more than happy to do that. And um, yeah, like even if it's a designer overseas, just go for it. Mm. I, most people in this industry started out where you are, <laughs> With it, whether they've had a formal training or not. Every We're all carnies at heart. We all got there our own particular way. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all very happy to help. And if they're not happy to help, you don't want to know them, <laughs> really. Mm. 
I think I think one of the things in there too is to be very important about we're really clear about what it is you want. Um, having someone ringing and saying, I really want to be in the film industry is the biggest turnoff. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody rings and says, God, I like what you did on Predestination, I thought it was fabulous. Is there any way you can help me? I will immediately down tools and say, yes, of course I can. I can think of this, this and this. I mean, I'm lucky enough to live in Melbourne. I, the VCA is in Melbourne, so they make student films every year. You can actually go to VCA and see what they need, even though you're not a student. Um, all those films need crews and they're not in, not everyone's on set, particularly sound people um, mm. are not on set. I would also um, get hold of all the organisations and get on their mailing lists and go to the opening of an envelope. No matter what it is, you turn up and <laughs> network, mm. and network and network and really take it, a, take it on yourself to research the industry, watch films, read the credits, see who people are. And, I mean, influencers have become enormously popular now, but they are important people. Find out who the key influencers of opinion are in the film world and get yourself known to them. Mm. Yes. Um, a bit of a shortcut, that one. Absolutely. Well, whilst we're with you, Gretchen, would you recommend any any books or any... Um, do you know of anyone who are, who's doing uh, courses or besides the film schools that if people wanted, were interested in sound recording that they'd be able to... Um, I'll, I'll have to try and find some of those. They are around, not not tend to be in you know, Australia, but there is the Sound Guild, yeah. which is um, Australian Screen Sound Guild, which um, you can belong to when they have a, a monthly meet online um, called the Sound Bar, and you can um, have a chat to find out who people are Excellent. and talk very, you know, talk very openly and frankly about what's going on. Yeah, awesome. And now, also, whilst we still, whilst we have you, um, we've got a question here from Alison, um, who's asking, and let me just have a quick read through it. I believe the question is somewhere around the balance between uh, re the recording of the dialogue and the re recording of the, the atmospheric sounds, the environmental sounds as well. And, that, and the work that she's been doing on the films, that there's so much of, um, uh, emphasis just on the dialogue but then all of the atmosphere will be built uh, later in projects in post. Um, how have you found uh, balancing your work and what you feel is most important for the sound to be captured on set and on location? Certainly uh, for me the dialogue is the most important because if you if it starts clean you can add anything to it. If it starts off muddy then you're already behind the eight ball. So you've got to get that as clean as you possibly can. Mm -hmm skills as a sound recorders to work out how to do that uh, and you've really got to stand up for yourself and say look you know this location is going to cost you this amount of money to resolve and solve in post-production mm -hmm. uh, is that the way you want to go that's yeah. you talk money you might get it solved um <laughs> <laughs> i find that's the the language producers speak uh, <laughs> really what at the end of the day how how much how much of a difficulty is to stop for 30 seconds and record the atmos whilst you've got everyone's heartbeats in one place? Um, and... Look, you can be clever about that. You don't really have to anymore. Um, they can sample so much stuff. I steal so many atmos atmoses. So I just record with my, I've got a you know, second language with my boomies who will, particularly crowd scenes, I will usually record those over checks because mm. you've actually got the actors' real voices in there make sure they're not talking about something they shouldn't. But um, <laughs> you can hear and recognise their voices in a, in a background of Atmos, so I steal most of mine. Yeah, wow. That would mm -hmm. be very clever. Um, and there is another question here for you, Gretchen, else we do have you. Uh, what, what's your take on gatekeeping on the signs for film? Wait a second. On what's that? I don't understand it. The gate? Hmm. Luana, I'm not, please forgive me if I get this, this question wrong. Um, what's your take on gatekeeping on the signs for film, the film, film industry? And do you see a lot of it today? I'm not being misunderstanding the question here or missing something. Um, in terms of getting in as a sound recordist and starting, um, I guess, how you, how you would recommend someone would do that today? To get into the sound into sound recording, um, I think you've probably got to turn up with a microphone, a pair of headphones, and a boom pole. <laughs> okay, so you'll need those bits and pieces of equipment to be able to start with. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. A pair of headphones and a microphone is a good place to start. Um, yeah. I would 
find a, a, a set somewhere, learn how to roll up a cable. Not that we use many of them anymore, but at least work out where the GPS, where the power is. That's the thing you can help by doing. Um, literally turn, turn up on a film set and say, this is, can I help you roll this up? Can I push your trolley around? Can I find that? Can I stop that noise? Um, make yourself useful. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and Erica, we've got some more questions for you. We've got some of these, uh, a bit of a specific technical one as well, which is um, if you've been asked to shoot in a flat or a raw image because, of course, they want to grade it later, um, what are your thoughts on applying the LUT and um, is the lighting still relevant? Now, I've got, mm. I'm guessing I know where this is going to go, but where are your thoughts here? Is the lighting still relevant? If the Read LUT is being applied. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, always. absolutely, yeah. always, 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 always. It's, you know, it's kind of like, it's like the air in which everybody moves. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, the lighting's crucial still. Um, there are, if you're shooting raw, then you're gathering a lot of data that will be, um, can be manipulated massively later. So a day scene can be turned to a night scene and indeed a night scene can most, most times be turned to a day scene. So there's a huge amount of flexibility in, in raw recordings. Um, you but the, define or explain what a raw recording is for people who might not know what that means? I'm sure. sorry. <laughs> sure. Um, raw, raw recordings are not video recordings. You can't look directly at a raw file and see a picture. It's not a picture. It's a collection of data. And that data has to be translated. Um, it has to be processed to turn it into a picture that we actually recognise as a photograph. So wow. um, it's it's a it's a huge amount of information um, that is typically you know, people shoot in raw a lot on uh, on major motion pictures um, for all of those reasons that you can do all of that manipulating in the post. Um, but, um, but there are, if you shoot in raw, then you've got a lot of flexibility for later on, but um, you cannot, unless you've got a huge post-production budget, you can't actually paint the light in later because that mm -hmm. will be a digital artist doing that frame by frame by frame by frame, and they're very expensive. Yeah, great. So, yeah. Now I have two last questions because I'm just keeping an eye on the clock. So in this one's going to be maybe in three words for each of you. What do you look for in a director that you're excited to collaborate with? I know, a hard one. Anyone can start on this. It doesn't have to be Erica, just because you were talking. <laughs> Thanks. For me, I think as soon as the director says to me, I care about sound, I go, uh-oh. <laughs> There's a fair chance you don't. <laughs> Gotcha. So you, that's yeah, a big furphy if you ever hear someone say, I care about the sound, but I do care about the sound. <laughs> I care about no, the sound. I won't ever say that. <laughs> always look for someone who's happy to collaborate and uh, happy to have a, a, a shorthand as to whether something actually really will work or not and understands that, that if I say it's not going to work, it isn't. Right, right. Being believed, I think, is a big one. And I think it's just working with somebody who's got the, um, um, I guess, the emotional intelligence or, or um, capacity to stick with the, the times when things get really fraught and tough and, um, and work through them because that's a guarantee that that time will come sooner or later that there will just be what appears to be a major breakdown. And, um, and if you've got a prima donna who just, you know, sort of, wants to have a tantrum or will have a tantrum at that time, then it just gets very hard to actually really solve the problem yeah. on, you know, in, in the pressure cooker of actually shooting because there's massive pressure. They're kind of like, you know, it's just this machine that's just sort of grinding down on the, on the set, on the crew all day, every day, every yeah. minute matters. And, yeah. um, and something, somebody having a tantrum is just kind of like so counterproductive. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And for me, it's probably that I mentioned before, a director who's really passionate and just emotionally invested mm. would be my main things. And as an editor, I know I said I come on, come on later, of course, than everyone else, but it's still good to work with someone who'll get you on at, at the script stage, mm. the, oh, even after it's written or slightly before. But, um, yeah, it's best to, if I come on at the script stage as well because then I can give feedback on on 
any changes or anything, but I've been involved in plenty of things, other things where you, I come in after it's been shot even, but I'd much prefer, prefer to come in earlier. Amazing, amazing. And Fiona? Oh, someone who uh, takes you on a journey with them. So you're they're, they're telling a story and takes you on that journey and they give give you space to collaborate. So bring something to that. So they're you know, having a, a strong vision, but also allowing everybody to do their job in that collaboration. And I will second what Erica says. It's that capacity to deal with when it's that when you're in the middle of the battle, it's not, don't lose your metal because mm -hmm. it's so tough and it's just staying true to course. You you know, a director is the captain of the ship in some way. Um, and they're the, the person or the conductor of the orchestra. They're the person we all look to. Are we doing the right thing and are we going in the right direction? And if they falter, it, it's like, well, then we all look for the next adult. Who's the next person that's actually going to help us get through that? <laughs> Fabulous. Who's the adult in the room? Yeah. <laughs> well, then my final question, really, really quickly, because I know we need to wrap it all up. Um, what is a superpower that you bring from outside of your work that really um, helps you with your jobs? Getting back up again. <laughs> Getting back up again. Yeah. I fell over. I did a big run on Friday. I fell over and I got back up again. You just have to keep yeah. getting back up. Resilience. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, I would say resilience too. Um, and um, my superpower is, is appearing to be extremely calm, even though I'm not. <laughs> Why do you laugh, Gretchen? <laughs> uh, I think mine is having a great sense of adventure, mm. wanting to know what's around that corner and up that hill and over there, <laughs> and uh, enjoying finding out and learning new things all the time, whether it's from oh, people, yeah. from people in front of the camera or behind it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and for me, I'd say empathy, which is important to an editor, uh, and everyone has that um, in the production process, and also patience. You know, we're sitting there for quite a long time, um, go, watching the film a lot of time, so you've always got to uh, keep that patience. And I did also want to say, like, even after my role, there's at least four other roles where, you know, we need more women involved, which, you know, is sound the sound pose composing visual effects and then the color grade as well so yeah i don't i'm not at the end of it there's heaps more afterwards so yeah oh, there are so many jobs and we need more women everywhere <laughs> absolutely well everybody thank you so much for joining us and thank you all of our panelists panelists for your generosity and insight and wisdom um, for everyone watching there are some incredible resources on the screen australia website uh, the, the media department has put, to, well, the comms department has put together a getting started guide, which is incredibly in depth, that has a lot of different articles within it, linked through it um, in conversations and interviews with people from across the film industry, other technical departments, Erica's done one, and there are, um, and then through all the writers, the directors, the producers, the executives as well. So read through all of those. Um, and I would love to thank Screenworks Screen Australia, the Gender Matters Task Force, and um, all of you wonderful people watching today. All the best with all of your work and your careers and your and just keep at it. We're around and yeah, we're here to change the industry. So let's do it. Thanks, Rosie. It was great. Well done. Thank you, Rosie. Thank, Thank you, Rosie. And um, I'd just like to jump in because uh, this, of course, is the, the last of our Gender Matters series, the fifth and final one. Um, and I think everyone who's been online will agree that this has been another um, absorbing um, and very informative conversation. So I would also like to thank our incredibly talented speakers uh, for sharing their experiences with us all this afternoon. I'm sure all you, of you out there will have gained insight and hopefully inspiration um, into what it really takes to work uh, in some of these key areas um, uh, of crew roles. So a huge and heartfelt thank you to our speakers, Erica, Fiona, Gretchen and Melanie. Um, and of course, to our excellent moderator, once again, Rosie Lord. Thank you everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>